Gregory, just to begin with you, let's just start with the presidential race in particular, as when we think 2024, primarily that's what we're thinking about. We've just had news within the last 20 minutes or so, Trump appealing the decision in Maine to bar him from the ballot in that state after Colorado had done something similar, and yet he is still the front runner. Iowa is still his to lose. What has really changed as we enter this election year? Yeah, I got exhausted just watching you uh, <laughs> lay out that calendar for us in January. And, and January is just the beginning of a year that's going to be full of those kinds of dates as, as President Trump is going to be in courtrooms facing four different uh, criminal uh, indictments in four different venues. And we've got the civil cases. Now we have this 14th Amendment uh, issue. And look, every time an issue like this has popped up, at least in the short term, Former President Trump gets a little bit of a blip in the polls among Republican likely voters. Uh, it's not a permanent blip. It always just sort of reverts back to the mean. But there is sort of a rallying around Trump effect that happens every time uh, that Republicans feel like he's being picked on by either Joe Biden or a prosecutor in New York or in Georgia or in this case, uh, the Colorado Supreme Court. Uh, saying that he can't be on the ballot because of his actions in uh, on January 6th what now, three years ago. Yeah, we're almost at the three-year anniversary. That'll be this weekend. So Trump remains far and away the front runner. That base of support firmly cemented. So frankly, when we talk about Iowa or New Hampshire, Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, when, Wendy, we're just talking about the race for the silver medal, essentially. Exactly right. The race for point. number two. Yeah. Exactly. And has Nikki Haley perhaps tripped in that race over her failure to mention slavery as a cause of civil war. Or even to be able to answer that question in full at all. Um, I think what she did was not necessarily damage herself with Republican primary voters, but she might have slowed what we were starting to see as a trend of people saying, Democrats, saying they wanted to register as Republicans in New Hampshire's open primary so that they could stop Trump by voting for Nikki Haley to make it a race, to make it not a foregone conclusion that Trump would be the Republican nominee. So I think not only her comments that she didn't mention slavery and the causes of the Civil War, and on top of that, also saying that um, she would pardon Donald Trump if he were convicted and she were president, I think that really makes people who might have cross the line to vote for her, think twice, and that might slow her momentum. Well, and she's not the only one who has said she would par pardon Donald yeah. Trump if given the opportunity to. Ron DeSantis has said the same thing. Again, we're talking about individuals who are running against him and yet are very quick to defend him, very reluctant to criticize him. What I fail to understand, Gregory, is because Trump's base is so cemented, they are not straying from him. Why still try to cater to the base? Why not try to cater to a wider group of voters, potentially, that could sway things in your favor? Yeah, the Republican uh, electorate in this uh, presidential primary season basically breaks down to a third, a third, and a third. And these are rough numbers. But you have the third sort of always Trump. You have a third that's going to be never Trump. And in the middle, you have a third that is Trump for now, yeah. but is and may be persuaded to look at another option, but they haven't seen that option yet, and also they haven't seen that Trump has disqualified himself yet. Uh, and so what we have is the same problem that we had in 2016, eight years ago, where we had uh, President Trump gaining momentum and the anti-Trump being split two, three, four ways late into the primary calendar. And as long as that dynamic continues, as long as it's DeSantis, Haley, Christie, and Ramaswamy, mm. Dividing that non-Trump vote or anti-Trump vote, it's going to be very easy for Trump to divide and conquer, win in these winner-take-all states later in the calendar, and sell up the nomination pretty quickly if this dynamic continues. Okay, so there's the presum presumptive Republican nominee. Let's talk about the presumptive Democratic nominee, which will be the incumbent president, mm -hmm. barring anything unforeseen happening. And if you look at the polling around Biden and his approval rating, and frankly, the core demographic that helped him get to the White House in the first place in 2020 Things are turning against him, Wendy. We have the numbers up here. Black voters, 87% supported him in the last cycle, down to 63. For Hispanic, it was in the 60s. Now we're down in the 30s. And Bloomberg's own polling with Morning Consult has showed something similar with young voters as well. Absolutely. How does he turn this around? I, I'm glad I don't work for the Biden <laughs> campaign because I don't know. I mean, he is literally hemorrhaging black voters and young voters. The war in Israel... Um, and his unbridled support for Israel is not helping him with young voters or voters of color um, who have more sympathy for the Palestinian cause. There's um, And don't see 
that as as a U.S. long term policy the way older voters do, um, and our polling is showing also that voters are trusting Trump more on the economy. That's where Biden is losing the black and Latino voters is that they trust Trump to fix the economy more than they do Joe Biden despite the evidence of a slow recovery that we're seeing. And the trouble is that the Biden campaign so far doesn't seem to be responding to that. They're sort of on this campaign of um, the economy's good, trust us, and Trump is bad. And the Trump is bad argument doesn't really work because, as Gregory said, Mm -hmm. things are pretty set in people's opinions. You're not going to change anyone's mind by saying Trump is bad. The people who believe that believe that. Mm. And the people who don't, don't. And I don't see a way to draw voters in by saying the other guy is worse. Yeah, it's definitely tricky. And on the issue you were talking about, about how the Palestinian death toll, specifically in Gaza, and how this administration has handled the conflict between Israel and Hamas, certainly maybe resonating with young voters. And this is also an issue on college campuses, including Harvard. (laughs) And we got some news on that today. Harvard President Claudine Gay has said she is resigning. She has done so in the aftermath of backlash to her testimony in December when she was before the House talking about anti-Semitism. Let's hear part of that exchange earlier last year. And Dr. Gay, at Harvard, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. I will ask you one more time. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? Anti-Semitic rhetoric. When it and is it anti-Semitic con- rhetoric? Anti-Semitic rhetoric when it crosses into conduct that amounts to bullying, harassment, intimidation, that is actionable conduct and we do take action. So the answer is yes, that calling for the genocide of Jews violates Harvard Code of Conduct, correct? Again, it depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. These are unacceptable answers across the board. That, of course, was Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, the Republican from New York. And Gregory, she actually posted on X in the aftermath of Gay's resignation today, saying two down, because, of course, the president of Penn, Liz McGill, already had resigned last year after that uh, hearing and the uproar that followed. Is this going to be enough to pacify members of Congress who are very upset with these institutions and those that govern them right now? No, and if anything, Elise Stefanik is also saying that she may in- expand the, the scope of the House Committee's uh, probe into higher education, uh, looking at the Board of Trustees at the Harvard Corporation, uh, the fellows who uh, seem to have played a role in, in ousting uh, Claudine Gray from the presidency of, of Harvard earlier today, um, and, uh, and extend it to all sorts of issues of the sort of this, uh, what they would call wokeism, the, you know, the progressive ideology on college campuses that for these sort of Trump uh, Republicans is a uh, part of the culture war that they want to fight in 2024. It's uh, very popular with their base, with uh, with a lot of the the Jewish donors, frankly, to the Republican Party. Uh, it's a winning issue for them, and uh, it's one that we can expect to see more hearings on as the course of the year goes on.